Well, it's very nice to be here. Thank you, Bob, for that introduction. Um, I, I was asked to come and, and talk about uh, bulbs in the landscape. And so could I have a quick show of hands? Uh, how many of you folks are nursery folks, you know, in the production end of the industry? Okay, how, okay. how many of you are uh, in the landscape end of the industry? That should be almost every other hand. What do some of you do who didn't raise your hand? Arborists, Arborists okay, that's good. Uh, so of you landscapers, some of you are putting bulbs in some of your landscapes, I'm supposing, so maybe maybe part of the audience, this is, this is right up your alley, hopefully. But I'm gonna, gonna talk about bulbs, and uh, we, we've been working on bulbs at Cornell, mostly in forcing, but also quite a lot of landscape work for the last 14 years. And there's lots of different kinds of bulbs. They're, they're, they're great uh, plants, they're great crops, they're interesting biologically and botanically. Um, we're not gonna get into all the details, but whenever you talk about bulbs, there are actually different kinds of thing that you hold in your hands. Some of them are actually bulbs, like a lily or a tulip or an onion bulb. Uh, some of them are rhizomes, like a, like a bearded iris. Some are tuberous roots like a dahlia, okay? And, and so they, they have different structures and, and that is important especially for propagation and, and some other issues. Um, whether, whether it's a bulb or whether it's a tuberous root is not particularly important that you know the difference as far as planting them and growing them in a, in a landscape situation. But it's, it's good to know that there's different, different kinds of, of storage organs because all of these plants, uh, you know, the, the storage organ evolves uh, over time as a, as a way of, in, in the case of most of these, most of these plants, um, certainly with, with lilies, uh, you know, it's, it's overwintering. Tulips, it's overwintering, but it also allows oversummering. You know, tulips go dormant in the summer, and that bulb allows the plant to stay in the ground uh, through the summer as well as the winter. Okay, and and all bulbs are perennials by definition. And so, when when you want to uh, get lots of enthusiasm and inspiration about bulbs, you would you would travel to Holland and go see the Kirkenhof that they have, which is about 20 miles west of Amsterdam. Uh, it's, a, it's a show garden, and they just plant bulbs by the gazillions in different combinations, and, it, and it's very beautiful. Uh, most of the bulbs that we use, um, there, there are, of course, exceptions that Bob mentioned, you know, with, with Easter lilies that my family is involved in. But most of the bulbs really that we, that we use in the landscape do come from Holland. And so here's a, a crocus field uh, in probably mid to late March uh, flowering in, in Holland. Uh, and you know, the fields when they flower, it, it's, it's absolutely, it really is truly beautiful. Um, the, the digging operations for bulbs uh, start in about mid-June, uh, maybe early June for some things and it goes for about six weeks. Uh, most of the tulips are harvested from about the third week of June until the middle of July. And so, um, you know, the fields are very sandy and the, the, the equipment that's necessary to do this is not nearly as big as you might, as you might imagine um, because the soil is very easy to, to pull things through it. And so, well, you can see a digger, uh, uh, tulip bulbs as they come out of the ground with all the side bulbs, which then there's processing and, and whatnot, and the side bulbs are removed and replanted. And then uh, sizing of the bulbs in the, in the lower left, you can't see, but there's holes of differing sizes that different size bulbs fall through, and that's how they grade them by size. And then planting stock of tulips on the lower, lower right. Uh, it, as far as we're concerned, you know, all these bulbs are packaged, uh, packed in various ways, and then everything comes to the U.S. on, uh, if not refrigerated containers, and, and for landscape use it would really never be refrigerated. Um, for forcing it might be, but uh, certainly in temperature controlled uh, shipping containers, the, the reefer that you see there, and then they're loaded onto boats and they, they come across the, uh, the Atlantic. And, uh, and get unloaded in, in Newark. You know, there's a lot of bulbs that are unloaded in Newark. Um, uh, uh, Charleston, some bulbs go to Charleston, and then Newport and, and the Chesapeake area where, where a lot of bulbs come into. 
So once the bulbs get here, well then, okay, well why, why landscape bulbs? And I would say, well, why not? Um, uh, you, you get early spring color and you get lots of color. Um, it's relatively easy to do and it has a high impact. Um, you, can, you can do a lot of this, a lot of the planting uh, and, and putting in beds in the fall, you know, as you're, as you're cleaning up uh, annual beds. And then, and then that, gives you, that gives you that impact first thing in the spring and, um, and people really appreciate that. And uh, when, when you have that impact early in the spring, then maybe people will start having some more ideas and they'll, they'll, it's a good chance to get some more work for later on in the season, okay? Um, and, the, and the climate is, is good for bulbs. I mean, it, with, within Kentucky, you're, you're similar to, we're, we're a little bit colder in Ithaca than you are and global warming, who knows where we all are, but we're, we're a little, we're, you know, we're only a little bit colder than you folks and, and, uh, and you know, summer wise, uh, so, long as, so long as you have a pretty well drained soil, a lot of bulbs are gonna do very well. Um, and, and this is good for landscape, for commercial landscapes, for home landscapes, private landscapes. And, and as you'll see, there's lots of good research-based information available that, that we and others have generated. And we have a website, flowerbulbs.cornell.edu, and some of the things, I'll, I'll be going to that website during the talk, and you can see specifically some of the information that, that we have available there, okay? Just a few more pictures of of uh, the Kirkenhof. So, well, th these, are, th these are tulips. This is, this is what we're involved with. And, and I, I've, in the last several months, I've, I've taken a much greater interest in native trees. My, my middle kid is doing an, an Eagle Scout project. And uh, part of that project, he's been building this trail and then we've been identifying some of the trees as the other part of the trail meanders through this woodlot. And so we've had a couple of folks out there and I've been learning about pignut hickory and bitternut hickory and tilia americana and, and you know, there's some oak trees out there and there's sugar maple. And so I've gotten to have a much greater knowledge of trees than I have had for quite a long time because this is normally what I think about. And this is, this is like 2,000 cultivars of tulips. And in, in the world, there's, there's about 3,000 cultivars that are in the trade or that are at least acknowledged to still be extant living cultivars. Uh, it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of variability. It, it's a lot of tulips to deal with. Um, and, and, we've, I, and I've only worked with a very, very small percentage of them. Are there any questions? Because I'm perfectly happy to take questions at any time. Any, anything come up yet? Okay. All right, so uh, as, as far as um, the purchase and handling of bulbs, the, the general advice is that you want to, uh, when your bulbs arrive, inspect them, unpack them. Um, hopefully they are not arriving uh, with, with shrink wrap around them. Okay, uh, the, the, the classic advice is that bulbs need to breathe because we all need to breathe and bulbs do, do respire, but, but the more important uh, reality with shrink wrapping uh, uh, pallets of for especially tulips is that when fusarium is present and fusarium is basal rot, which is a, uh, it's kind of a tan dry rot on the bottom of the bulb which is why they call it basal rot. And, and that fusarium uh, produces ethylene gas. And you might know ethylene gas as being the hormone that causes flowers to senesce and tomatoes to ripen. And the ethylene gas that the fusarium produces can also kill the flower that's down inside of a tulip bulb. So over, it, it's taken a long time, and it's, it's really been something that's been going on since the 70s, but, but the industry understands that they need to ship bulbs in, in ventilated crates, which is why if you, if you get them in, in a large quantity, they come in those black plastic crates, or they come in boxes with holes punched in the side of them. Um, and and, and the, the industry does not shrink wrap things because if you did that, then the ethylene would stay inside the box and damage the bulbs. But other, other transport people might do that as a course of putting the, the loads together. So, you know, just make, make a note of that. Um, uh, if, if they are shrink wrapped, get rid of the plastic as soon as possible, open up the boxes, try to get some air on them. Um, if there's a little bit of surface mold, you know, just, just uh, external extraneous mold, that's not a problem. Um, the bulb should be firm and, and tight, not mushy. 
Um, and then in almost all cases uh, in the landscape situation, store at moderate temperatures. So if, if you're anywhere between, you know, I, I'm saying here 60 to 65 is about perfect, but it can be, you know, into the upper 50s. It, it can be even a little bit warmer than 65. But you don't want it to be up into the, you know, uh, 90s. Uh, if, if you were storing a lot of these bulbs and especially tulips at, at 90 or 95 degrees for four or five days, most of the flower buds are gonna be killed inside the bulb. Okay, and that's not likely to happen, but you should know about it. Okay, um, site selection. So, we, you know, I, I think I think the general gist is that you need to have a very well-drained soil. If 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 you're going to do anything dealing with with flower bulbs and, and a lot of plants, but especially flower bulbs, you need to have a well-drained soil. So. Um, you know, the heavy rainfall should be drained away within eight to 12 hours. Well, you know, I, I think I, that's, you see that written. I don't particularly subscribe to that. It should be gone away much faster than that. Um, the, the pH, you know, uh, six to seven, um, I, I think they're reasonably tolerant of that. Uh, we'll talk about weeds perhaps in a little bit. Um, light conditions, um, most spring bulbs are pretty much full sun plants because there, there aren't leaves on the trees when they're flowering. Uh, as, as the season progresses and as the trees leaf out, the, the bulbs still have green leaves and the idea is that those green leaves are photosynthesizing, making new sugars and food and whatnot to, to build the bulb back up. Um, and and some, some spring bulbs do very well under partial shade. You know, anemone blanda is, is an example. Um, some tulips do well under part shade, and, 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 and some daffodils and hyacinths do well under part shade. But, but not heavy shade is a, is a general rule, okay? And then think about microclimates. Um, you know, exposure, wind, wind, wind breaks and all of that. And as landscape folks, you're thinking about these things all of the time. Um, but but in, in most of your climates here, the, the, main, the main spring bulbs are going to be winter hardy without any difficulty whatsoever. Um, you, you folks could probably tell me a lot more about weed control in the landscape because I, I really am not an expert in this and my, my basic uh, line of defense is, is Roundup and I know that there's other more exotic things to be, to be used. Um, but you know, from a, in a small scale, people talk about suffocating the ground with newspapers and getting rid of the weeds that way. And for homeowners, that's probably fine. Um, and, and the drainage thing, I, I will show you as we go through um, some research we've been doing over the last couple of years. And, and I think that this, that this still, I, I talk about it, but I think people are still um, don't necessarily believe that. And, uh, we, we've come up with a, well, I have to be careful, uh, Gusta Hertog uh, actually came up with this, but we have sort of reinvented and reworked um, a technique called modified mulching or top planting, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and I'll show you some pictures, but it, it bears talking about just for a moment here. Um, and, and this is especially good for large areas, you know, beds or swaths of bulbs. Where, where you go through and, and till the ground with, with a rototiller a few inches deep, just as you normally would, and then, um, and then plant the bulbs uh, just ever so slightly, you know, one or two inches. And, and, and in some cases, just drop them on the ground, on the tilled ground. But the thing is, you, you don't go and dig a six or seven inch hole, okay? I mean, it, when you go and look at most of the advice uh, and I might even say it here, you know, plant the bulb three times deeper than the bulb is high. That's kind of the standard advice. So crocuses are three inches deep and tulips are six or seven inches deep by that measure. And I'll show you pictures that, that deep planting is probably the worst thing you can do for a tulip in terms of getting it to perennialize. And, and what we have found to be very good, and it, and it eliminates having to dig holes, but it does require mulch on top is to, uh, and, and this, I, I, will, I will apologize because this slide really is, we have since, we have since changed this. We're gonna change that to that right there. You'll have to remember that on your, see, I did, he's, he's taping that. He just saw the change being made. Um, so anyway, put, put the bulbs on the ground and then cover them with like four inches of good mulch. 
So there's no hole digging, there's mulch on top, and, and by far this has been the best technique for getting tulips to perennialize. I mean, by far, if you're interested in tulips perennializing. Uh, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, because a lot of times tulips are very good just as annuals and you plant them back every year. Um, but this, this is interesting, and I'll show you the pictures, okay? And so you can fiddle with pH. Um, yeah, so we've talked about a lot of this already, you know, to the, this, this rule of thumb. And, and again, for tulips, I think that this deep planting is not, not the best thing that we should be doing. Um, when do you plant bulbs here in Kentucky? I'm, I'm guessing uh, October is probably the perfect time. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's in, in Ithaca, we plant them anywhere from September until the ground fully freezes. And that's the other thing. If, you, if you're not able to get things planted or if people call late in the season, if you still have good bulbs, plant them you know, until the ground freezes. It, it, you, you can't hold bulbs over the winter and plant them in the spring as, as bulbs. You, know, you, you cannot do that. Uh, it, you're asking a lot of these bulbs uh, to, to be dug in June and to hang out until the following March to be planted. You know, you just can't do that. If, if, they, if they don't get planted before the ground freezes, then it's pretty much bye-bye. Pretty much um, uh, are, are, there, are there greenhouses or nurseries in Kentucky and in, in the Midwest, and I'm, I'm sure there are, where you can buy uh, young growing plants in the spring, like cell pack bulbs, and plant those directly into the ground. You know, I, I think there's an increasing trend, certainly at the at the homeowner level, and and it would be great at the landscape level too, for you know planting in the springtime rooted and sprouted bulbs, where they've they've taken tulips, hyacinths, daffodils. Um, and, and put them either into small four inch pots like three inch pots or even large cell packs and drop the bulbs in there, planted them, put them in the cooler and let them root and then they're sold you know, in, in the spring as, as, soon, as soon as you can get out and start planting things in the spring. And, and this is a good theory for folks who forget to plant bulbs in the fall or, or when they otherwise don't get planted. And the other thing is that you kind of get an instant reward. You know, our society is getting towards the point where we don't like to wait more than a minute and a half for anything. And so, so one, of, one of the difficulties that the bulb industry has, and, and maybe, maybe in the tree industry too, because it, it's such a long-term thing, people have to plant a bulb in October and then wait until April and May to see the result. And, and half the time people forget that they plant them and on and on. So that, that's a big issue for the, uh, for the bulb industry. Um, yeah, well, I'm, see, I'm, I'm, I have clairvoyance. I'm always talking one slide ahead. Uh, containers, not just in the ground, but containers are, are great. This is an example of, of, it's more than a container, it's, it's huge in, in Holland, but the idea of just you know, raised beds, raised containers, raised uh, areas into an entryway or a walkway, whatever. Um, when you start thinking about design, and I'm not a designer, uh, I, I really don't know anything about how to design a landscape, but uh, you do want to think about the color and the combinations. Sometimes the client specifies that. Uh, usually it's nice to group them in masses or, or in not just two or three at a time. Uh, don't plant them in straight lines. This, this is what you don't want to do, generally. You know, uh, this is the men's garden at Cornell and everything's, every, well, this is, doesn't happen anymore, but they were all in these long straight lines and, and it was a nice show, but um, a little bit too formal for most situations. Think about flowering time because there are different seasons of flowering and height um, and compatibility with other landscape plants. I'll show you a website that we've put together where we've looked at different bulb and perennial combinations and how they can coexist and, and do well as combination plantings. Um, to get early season color from the bulb and then to use the perennial to just on it by its own growth cover the foliage so you don't have to go in and take away the foliage. You know, we've got a couple of great examples of that. In general, if you, if you only have bulbs or, or if bulbs are the main thing in the beds before you come in and put annuals and, it, it, and you want them to perennialize, it is important to leave the leaves intact, okay? Uh, as long as the leaves are green, 
it's important that they're there because they are photosynthesizing to build the bulb back up. If you go and, and cut the leaves off early, then the, the earlier you do that, the less regrowth that the bulb has. And so the longer you leave the leaves on, the better. Okay, uh, and you can just compare this here where you can see these rows that have been planted out and, and this, this is a dense planting in Holland but they're not in rows. They, they, um, they, they kind of till the beds but they don't really have to till these beds in, in a sense because it's basically pure sand, okay? And, and are there any people from Holland here? One of the things that my, our, my friends in Holland, they always say, well, people should be able to plant a bed like this in 10 minutes. And they, it's like, uh, I'm not sure. Um, but they, they, have, they have these spades and they have sand. And I, I, I should have put the video in, but, but they literally, they pick the bulb up. They, they have these really great spades and they plunge it in, pull it back, drop the bulb in. Pick the bulb up, plunge it in, pull it back, drop. And so they're, they're planting 30 or 40 bulbs. They're, they're probably planting 30 bulbs a minute per person. You know, and they and they just they just do this all day long. You know, but it's it's sand and it's very easy. It's very different than what most of us are dealing with. So here's a here's a clump of, of tulips. Uh, this you know it makes a nice show. Okay. Um, for, for maintenance then and 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 perennializing and and what you should do with this. Um, at, at planting, it's always good to put some fertilizer, to use fertilizer. Uh, there's bulb boosters or kind of slow release fertilizers. Phosphorus is especially important, so a relatively uh, high percentage of phosphorus. Um, this is kind of a bulb booster or similar fertilizers are kind of a one to one to one ratio. Um, you know, the analysis is different, but it, it's a relatively higher rate of phosphorus, which is good. Uh, use it at whatever the recommended rate is. Um, because they change formulations and the rate of pounds per hundred square feet changes all the time, it seems. Yeah, question? When you're planting the bulbs, does the bulbs have to be placed upright all the time? Oh, great question. The question is when you're planting bulbs, do they have to be planted upright all the time? How many of you say they have to be planted upright all the time? Or at least part of the time? <laughs> How many of you say it doesn't make a bloody bit of difference? Well, there's a lot of you must be the arborists. You're not voting, okay? Um, all right. So no, you you don't. You by and large, you do. You really don't have to put the pointy end up, right? Um, people do that, and whenever you see the videos, that's what happens. And when you're planting bulbs with kids, that's what happens. But I can tell you that there's, there's 50,000 acres of bulbs that are planted every year in Holland by machine. And they just drop out of the bin and they go into the ground however they go and they're covered up. Okay, it makes no difference. The, the, the only bulb where, where it, it, there's two where it might be good to do that. Uh, one is Fritillaria imperialis, you know, the big crown imperial the ones that smell like skunks. Those are big, expensive bulbs, and people actually, I don't know if this is important, I really don't, but it kind of makes sense, but they actually suggest planting those bulbs on the side because when you look at those bulbs, there's a giant hole on top of the bulb where the stem from last year came, and the theory is that if you plant it on its side, the first year stem will have to grow out that way and then it grows up, but then, during that first winter when it gets really wet, water won't get down inside of the bulb and start rotting. Okay, that's the theory. I, I don't know if I buy it, okay? But, but they're expensive enough that it's maybe worth doing that. In hyacinths, in the industry in hyacinths, they are planted, every hyacinth bulb is hand placed in the field. Okay, they, they have machines that do all the work up to that, but then they can come through with people and, and very quickly, do, 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 you know, and, and as they go along. But that's, that's to keep those bulbs round and, and, and they're more expensive because of that. But it's not necessary, okay? So none of these bulbs really, if you really get down to it, have to be hand placed in any particular way. So dig a hole, toss them in, cover them, or take some bulbs and just gently scatter them and plant them where they, where they lie. Okay. Um, okay, selective use of Roundup. Um, I, I don't think that there is any uh, pre-emergent herbicide out there that is 
safe to use on all bulbs. Okay, so if you if you wanted to go in and, and spray beds before they came up and you had mixed beds, uh, Mark Sarnota, who, who now is at Georgia, did some work and, and Dan sent us, uh, uh, Andy Senesak in Long Island has also done quite a lot of herbic pre-emergent herbicide work and they found nothing that is safe on all species. Okay, there are some things that are safe on some species, but it, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, the, the herbicide thing is difficult with, with bulbs. Okay, so what, why don't they perennialize? If they, in general, you probably would say that tulips are not the best perennials. Uh, Probably daffodils are excellent perennials here. Is that, that should be, that should be true. Hyacinths, good perennials, that should be true. I'm, yeah, that should be. Crocus, good, you know, muscari should be good. Um, but tulips, uh, why don't they perennialize? There's a couple of, couple of reasons. Um, there are differences between species and cultivars, and I, I've got, we've got some information on that. I think in the handout, on the back page, there's a listing of uh, maybe 20 or 25, 30 tulips that were good perennials in a, in a range of locations in some work that we did uh, eight to 10 years ago. So those, those might be good ones to try. Uh, poor drainage, uh, that's probably the absolute number one site, not allowing the leaves to stay for senescence. Uh, if you had small, weak, or diseased bulbs to begin with, um, animals, do you guys have deer here? Are, are deer a problem? Do you have, yeah, okay, do you have voles and critters? Yeah, uh, we're deer. We could talk about deer afterwards, but I, I, I don't want it to be on the microphone. I don't want it to be recorded, but we, we hate, we hate deer. We absolutely, all deer should be shot. Um, uh, yeah. Huh? They're good on the grill. They're good on the grill. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> stew, turn them into venison stew. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so maybe, maybe from ice melting, there's a lot of salt in the soil. That could be uh, not enough light. Yeah, maybe, could be. Competition from tree roots, well, it could be, de depending on what you have. Maybe the site is too dry and it's just not the right site. Uh, people, people um, we see this in Central Park a lot in New York City uh, when, we, when we have to go down there uh, on occasion. Um, that that after, after daffodils flower, they, they bunch the leaves together and bend them over like a ponytail and then wrap them up with rubber bands so that they're very tidy. But this is the worst thing you could do because it, it doesn't allow the leaves to photosynthesis. So don't do that. Uh, maybe things could have been frozen in the winter, although it, that's, that's difficult to do. I mean, it's difficult to freeze, to freeze a bolt. Tom, do you have a? With the drought going on with the areas where they have bulbs, do they need to water those like even though you don't have any leaves now? Right, good question. With the drought going on, probably the drought is the best thing that can happen to, to spring flowering bulbs because tulips in a lot of these bulbs are native in like parts of southern Spain and Turkey and, and over, you know, end up Iran, right? So, so they get cold, cold weather in the winter with, with decent snow, and then the summers are generally warm and bone dry. And, and that's the climate that the tulips especially evolved in. So, so w one of the problems that's sort of wrapped up in all of this is when you, have, when you have bulbs and then you plant annuals on top of them and you're forever watering the annuals in the summer, the soil stays moist, it's warm, and that's the perfect climate for fusarium, this basal rot disease to come in. So, so in fact, summer irrigation is not as good for the bulbs as just leaving things bone dry. But of course, you, you, can't, you can't do that, right? Because you, you want to have a garden. Um, and the other thing about this in particular with tulips is that t tulips are very interesting. Every year, the bulb, yeah, did you? Don't see uh, soil compaction on your list there. Um, well, no, it's not specifically listed, but I, let's, let's put that under poor drainage. You know, so, so soil compaction and, you know, not enough air and the whole thing that goes along. And I, and I realize with, with landscape construction that that is a, can be a big issue. 
And that, that's another reason why this top planting deal, where you, you, you till a little bit, put the bulbs on and mulch them, you'll, you'll see the pictures. That, that's a really, really good deal. Okay. Um, the other thing specifically with tulips is that they, the bulb completely consumes and then reforms itself every year. Okay, so it's like after, like it's like when here, after he sits and listens to this lecture, his whole body goes out through his ear and then goes back in the other ear and he reforms himself. That's kind of what tulips do. Um, as they're flowering, the, the original bulb that you planted is shrinking and being consumed and then about the time that they stop flowering, there's a little bulb down inside that starts explosive growth. And, and whatever's left from the old bulb gets sucked into that new bulb and all the current photosynthesis and sugars from the leaves get pulled down into that new bulb and it develops from inside the bulb. So the bulb that you dig up the next year is, is not the same bulb that you planted. You know, the, the original bulb has gone away and a new bulb has formed in its place. And so that's quite a trick, you know, I mean, for, to be able to do that is, is quite, quite an interesting way of life. And, and, and daffodils and hyacinths just keep adding layers and layers onto the existing bulb, which is why they're, it's one of the main reasons why they're better perennials than most uh, lilies or most um, tulips. Okay, so we have several choices. Um, I can, I can talk a little bit of, and show you some pictures of and to convince you that there's quite a lot of differences in cultivar perennializing ability and I think that this, this would probably be quite useful. I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the planting depth and we can talk about lilies and perennializing lilies um, in combination plantings with perennials. So those, those are the possibilities and we can, we can do anything that you guys want to, to listen to. Um, I, let, let me just show for sure some of, some of the results of this. This is some work that we did in the early 2000s. Uh, we, we did it in Ithaca and we're zone five. We did it at Riverhead on Long Island. Well, at the time it was zone six. Now it's probably zone seven but it always was zone seven. We, we only just now know that it's zone seven because it, it, it hasn't changed. We just, we just know differently. Um, and then in Clemson, I think, I think Clemson is now uh, probably the cold end of zone eight, I think, if, if, I, if I remember the, the most recent map. So we planted a whole bunch of uh, tulips, daffodils, and hyacinths in, in miscellaneous or special bulbs in plots in these three locations and we followed them for four years and we took data on what came back and what didn't. Uh, this is a picture of these trials in Ithaca. This is uh, an example of what they look like in Long Island and uh, just some more pictures. Um, you can see in the lower left, everything's mulched. It's very nice. That was the first year. I can tell you it never looked that good for the whole rest of the experiment. It goes on and on. But tete-a-tete, but -tete, you're probably all familiar with tete-a-tete. -tete. It's that little yellow one. It's, it's generally a very good landscape perennial bulb in a, in a lot of places. It wasn't, it wasn't as good at Clemson, but it was, it was in the top five in both Ithaca and Long Island. Um, Ice King, which is a white double, um, it, it was good. It was good all the way around. I mean, it was it was one of this little asterisk means that it was in the in the top rankings in, in all the locations. Perhaps not quite as many flowers in Clemson, but but still a very good daffodil. Um, Fragrant Breeze, uh, you know, just a, a, a good performer. Okay, it was the best one in Long Island, um, but 26 that still put it in the upper third in Clemson. Um, chanterelle, a kind of a split cup, I mean just an incredible display of flowers, okay? So I would encourage you to use, you know, this website and that newsletter to, to come up, you know, if, if, it's, if it's appropriate in, in your situation to try to select daffodils that really have been evaluated and that are, that are truly going to be better performers. Uh, Carlton, the big uh, yellow uh, cup daffodil, tremendous display of flowers. Um, and on and on we go, okay? Now, uh, we have the same information in the same website, right, right, right down at the bottom of that, of that roll of newsletters. Uh, same kind of information on hyacinths, okay? Which hyacinths were the best ones around, okay? 
Um, you know, Delft Blue, which is a, a very common hyacinth, was, was, gave a good show even after four years in all three locations. What you see with hyacinths is that they don't, they don't look like the pictures, you know, with the huge, very upright gazillions of flowers, you know. They don't look like that after four years. They're, they're looser, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're definitely smaller, but they're still there and they're still fragrant and they're still making good color in the springtime and they are good perennials, you know, when they have, when they have drainage, okay? okay. So uh, anyway, there's, there's some examples of, again, these are, these are four-year pictures. This is a picture in Ithaca after four years, Long Island. So hopefully that will be useful to you. Any questions on that? Yeah? After four years, is it recommended to actually uh, replant those varieties back into those beds to continue to do, or do you lose some type of hybridization over the period of time? Well, so there, there's no, the question is, you know, replanting back in the beds. There, there's no hybridization, you know, there's no, there's no crossing that goes on. Um, what happens, and I was talking to the gentleman from the Cincinnati Zoo, with when, when you have beds, and, and I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know an easy answer for this, when you have beds that have been in, for example, tulips year after year after year, you know, it's, at some point there, there begins to be some amount of disease buildup in that soil. Probably fusarium is, is probably a lot of what that is. And I'm aware of any fungicides that, that, you, that you would even want to, to put out there, let alone whether you really could or not, okay? And so, um, so, so the one solution, and it may not work, but depending on the situation, is to move the bed. You know, in Holland, they have grass areas and they have beds here for three years, and then they move them over there, and then they move them there, and then they go back to their same. So you have a rotation if it's an area where you can do that. Um, do, you do a comment? Yeah, we're uh, trying to create a few sensory gardens here at Burnheim. Do you have any particular bulbs that produces a nice roll-on soil smell that you personally like? You know, uh, oh yeah. I mean, I know they all have different, you know. Yeah. So, what, what would be some good bulbs uh, to use for sensory gardens? If you want to have sensory gardens in the spring, you would for sure have hyacinths. Uh, you, you, if you would get some uh, Fritillaria imperialis, uh, maybe people won't like the smell of that, but it it has a smell. It's a very skunky <laughs> smell. Okay, but it's not, it's not unpleasant, you know, right? I mean, I tell people that it smells like money because those bulbs are so expensive that whenever you walk into some guy's bulb shed and it's like, okay, you're working with Fritillaria, that's good, you're making money. Um, in, in the summer, you would, you would certainly want to go with, with any number of oriental hybrid lilies, okay? Uh, the o, they've got OT hybrids now, which are newer hybrids, you know, and they're, and that's, I mean, those are, those are very fragrant uh, summertime. Um, what other ones? I mean, those are uh, muscari, grape hyacinths in the spring, as some examples, and I'll, I'll think of some more. Okay. Um, all right, do you want to take a quick bulb tour of, of cultivars or do you want to see this planting depth stuff first? Planting depth, okay. All right. Um, so maybe, maybe three or four more minutes, okay. Uh, the onions, alliums are great. Uh, Globemaster or Giganteum, there's other ones, but, but alliums are great. Uh, in, the, in the late spring garden, they can, you can plant them through the garden. You, it gives you focal points of color and form through the garden to, to tie the whole thing together. The leaves are not so great by the time they flower, so it's a perfect thing to interplant with other perennials. Allium Christophii is a, uh, is, is a looser form of, of an onion, uh, but, but pretty, pretty commonly available. These flowers are uh, nine, 10 inches across, okay? Um, some other pictures of them. They, they perennialize and combine well with a lot of different plants. Um, <coughs> and there's, there's a range of them. There, there are uh, uh, purple and bluish onions. Allium molly is a little yellow one. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a small allium um, and, and you just plant it in, in big masses and it gives you some color in uh, late May, early June. Um, 
there's a whole bunch of them, okay? Uh, Schubertii, uh, this, this is the strangest one of all. These flowers will be 18 inches across. You know, they're just, they're, they're absolutely, they're incredible. And they're probably more useful as dried flowers, you know, for, for kids in the wintertime because they they're not quite as showy as they look here in the picture, but the size, they, they, they are truly incredible uh, plants. Um, autumn crocus, uh, colchicum autumn now. Uh, there's double forms and single forms, and, and this is one that's interesting because it will flower right in the garden center in the, in the package that it comes in in, in the fall because uh, it, it flowers without leaves being present. Um, but that's what it looks like in the, uh, in the fall landscape. Um, you're all adults and most of you have had your kids, which is good because these are uh, carcinogenic. You know, the, the bulbs contain colchicine, which is you know, called colchicum. And colchicine is a mutagen that is extracted from these things. So it, it's generally nice if you wear gloves when you're handling these. Don't eat them. And this is not a good kid's garden plant, okay? Um, in, in the spring, it makes leaves, uh, and then the leaves die down, and it makes flowers by itself in the fall. Uh, cyclamen, there's a bunch of hardy cyclamens. This one was dug out of the wild, uh, out of Turkey, uh, and they don't do that anymore. They say they don't do that anymore, and I, I mostly believe them, but that's quite a, that's quite a specimen there flowering without even being planted. But there's a number of, uh, of hardy cyclamen, heterofolium and coom, that are very nice for, for shade spots. Uh, foxtail lily, Aramurus, a uh, great plant, um, incredible flowers, um, you know, just thousands of thousands of flowers probably on a stem. Um, and they're anywhere from three to eight feet tall, depending on which one you get. And, and the leaves also are a little bit ratty when they flower, so camouflaging those a little bit is good. Uh, Eucomus is a genus that's up and coming. It's a very interesting genus. Uh, maybe another interesting one for your scent garden. You know, it doesn't have the greatest, the nicest scent, but it, it has a scent. Uh, it's not hardy, so you would use this as a container plant or, or put it in the ground, but you've, you've got to dig it up in the fall. Um, because it's not hardy. Uh, Crown Imperial, uh, very, very impressive plants. Um, and generally good perennials in a good, in a good area, they will come back uh, for years on end, um, and, and, but not the best smell. There's a yellow form and, and many other ones. Uh, this is what the uh, bulbs look like, and you can see they're kind of in the, well, you can't see it on the screen as well. But this is the one where maybe you plant it on its side so that the water doesn't go down into the main hole. Uh, Fritillaria meleagris, which is a little uh, checkered lily. Uh, it's a little um, kind of naturalizing type of a fritillaria. Um, nice little plant, the deer love these. The, the deer don't eat these, but they love these. And so that's something to watch out for. You, you can plant, you can have a fritillaria imperialis, because the next question is, well, can you, can you make like a, like a ring of daffodils, you know, like Fort Knox? And then, and then plant tulips inside that, and so the deer won't find the tulips. No, you can't do that. We, we, we did studies trying to figure out which bulbs, which uh, plants deer like to eat, and so we had fritillaria, we had tulips, daffodils, we had 30 or 40 different kinds of bulbs planted in gallon containers, and in the spring, we let them grow, and we mixed them all up, and put them in these long rows in, in locations all through Ithaca, okay, where there's gazillions of deer. And, and the deer would, would walk the rows of these bulbs and they would eat the tulips and they would not touch these plants. You know, the, we, we have, the, there, were, there were pot to pot in the trays before we even set them out. We put them out the, the night and then the next morning we were gonna row them out. There was fritillarias, daffodils, and tulips all in the same crate. They, they were physically touching each other. They ate the tulips, they didn't touch this plant. So they, they go right down with their nose and they ate what they wanted to eat and didn't. So a, a, a barrier of daffodils is not gonna, it's not gonna do it. Um, Leucogem, uh, this, this uh, gravitate giant, it's, it's a late flowering, uh, looks, looks a lot like a daffodil, leaves. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a summer snowflake. It's a great plant, uh, excellent perennial, uh, the, uh, leucogem. Uh, Pushkinia in the spring, it's, it's a little ground cover plant. It's great. We've talked about the muscari, the grape hyacinths. Um, 
There's different species, but the, the, the common Armeniacum is by far the most widely planted. Latifolium has a wider leaf, and then there's, there's pink ones and white ones, and there's double forms, and there's many different ones. And then, of course, crocus. Uh, you can plant crocus if, if you have informal lawn areas. You can, you can plant crocus by the masses in the lawn. Just don't mow that turf area until the leaves mostly senesce. So if, if you have turf areas that you, that you don't have to maintain to you know, Augusta national standards, that, that you, can let them, you can let them grow wild a little bit until, I, I don't know when it would be around here, uh, end of May perhaps. Uh, then you could go through and mow, and then you would have perennial crocus in huge swaths in the lawn. It would be beautiful. Um, Arum italicum is, is a great plant. It's got spring foliage. Uh, flowers are not so much, but really, really cool fruit in the fall. Um, and and it's, so there's a lot of diversity. Anemone blanda, a good one for partial shade under a little bit of trees. It's a low uh, spring flowering uh, ground cover plant. It's just absolutely beautiful. Here it is flowering, and then we've got all of these onions behind ready to come up. Uh, Iris reticulata, the little dwarf iris. Um, they're good perennials. Anybody know this plant, Iris bucarica? Um, it's, it's been a really great plant. It looks, it's, it's a short plant. It looks a lot like a, like a corn stem, but then it's got these white and yellow iris flowers on top of it, Iris bucarica. Uh, erythronium. Uh, erythronium is, once you get it in the garden, it's a great perennial. The difficulty is that, is that the bulbs are oftentimes a little sketchy. You know, they, the ones, we've had it in several times, and it's always been full of disease and, and not very good material to plant with. But pagoda, once you get it in the garden, it's gonna be around for a long time. So we could go on and on, uh, but I think, you know, we had, we had all, sorts of, all sorts of plants there. Um, and I know that I've gone long, uh, or almost have gone long. But I hope this has been useful. I, I hope that there's been some things that are immediately helpful and other things that you can think about over time. So any questions? Any last questions? Yeah. The onion type flowering bulbs, do they, do they spread seed? Uh, the, do the onion type flowering bulbs spread seed? That Allium molly uh, will seed a little bit. It'll move around, but, but I, I would say not in a bad way. Um, I've, I've never known any of the larger flowered onions to, to do any, any seeding that's, that's noticeable, you know. Uh, yeah. Are there any bulbs in the industry that are native to North America? Bulbs that are native to North America, uh, yeah. There's a number of lilies that are native to North America. Camassia, uh, cohosh. Uh, is native to North America. There are, and, and if, you, if you think about North America, well, there's many, many more choices. If you start talking about Appalachian, well, you have to be a little bit more careful. Zephyranthes, you know, there's rain lilies. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, there are things out there, sure, definitely. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.